Hello, this is Jeff Custer, and this is the Wednesday night Bible class for the Fort Walton Beach Church of Christ. We're studying about the how and the who of baptism. Uh, there are a lot of uh, Bible verses that command baptism. Here's one of them. Uh, uh, I'm going to be reading from Mark chapter 16. Uh, and he said to them, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. You know, everybody, practically everybody agrees that baptism by immersion would be acceptable to God. And personally, for me, uh, well, then what's the problem? Uh, there's still a, a digression from that, though. And so you have folks that say, well, it also would be all right to pour water on a person and Others that say, well, maybe it is okay to sprinkle water on a person. But listen, uh, we don't want to be playing the odds on this. We, in all matters relating to God, we should follow the way that is certain, not speculation. And uh, so if, as all, all I almost unim, unanimously agree, if baptism uh, by immersion in water for the remission of sins is, in fact, the original mode of baptism, the how of baptism, then certainly that's what we would want to do. But beyond that, uh, there is also uh, some, something to say about the entomology of the word. Entomology is the study of the historical development of a word's meaning. And uh, if you went to an English dictionary and you looked up uh, baptize or baptism, you would get what it means generally in society today. Uh, so an English dictionary is concerned about how it is used by people today, whether they use it right or not, uh, no matter what the entomology of the word. The entomology, if you have a dictionary that actually talks about that, the entomology of the word goes back to what it meant in the beginning. In the case of baptism and baptize, it would say we go back to uh, a baptizo, baptizing, and we look at the meaning of those Greek words in the first century uh, and find out what the word meant then. We don't care about what it means today as much as what it meant in the first century, what it means, therefore, in the Bible, and what we should understand, therefore, today, no matter what an English dictionary might say. And there's pretty much agreement uh, that uh, uh, baptism does mean to immerse or to dip. And uh, you could go through uh, uh, the American Heritage Dictionary says, uh, baptize is derived from the Greek baptane, to dip. Uh, the Anchor Bible Dictionary says the Greek verb for baptize, baptizane, is formed from baptine dip and means dip frequently or extensively, plunge, immerse. Uh, Origins, a short etymo etymological uh, dictionary of modern English says, the effectual origin lies in Greek baptizane, a modified form of baptane to dip in water. So baptism is never uh, sprinkling or pouring, but rather it's this immersion in, in or dipping into the water. Massey Shepherd wrote this about uh, uh, the Greek from which uh, the word baptize is derived. He says the original mode of baptism was by immersion of the entire body in water, but widely accepted method since the second century has been baptism by effusion or pouring. Uh, the normal method in ancient times was immersion, uh, as the ancient baptistry show Robert Mortimer abs. And so these two gentlemen are basically saying, okay, in the beginning, uh, it, the, the ancient form of baptism, the first, in the first century, what it was done in the first century was everyone immersed. Uh, and the one, um, uh, Massey Shepherd, argues that uh, pouring became more common in the second century. Uh, but uh, uh, others would argue immersion stayed pretty popular even longer than that. But what more important is the original method of baptism, the original how of baptism was to immerse. There are uh, 
a lot of scriptures which indicate baptism as a burial. Probably the greatest one would be uh, Romans chapter 6 and, and verse 4. Uh, there it says, we were buried therefore with him by baptism into death. Uh, Anders Nygren, who uh, wrote a commentary in the book of Romans, when he was commenting on Romans 6 and verse 4, he said, when he who is baptized is immersed in water, the act signifies burial with Christ. And uh, he again comes up out of the water and that signifies resurrection with Christ. Uh, Everett Harrison about this same passage said, apparently Paul pictures burial with Christ. However, momentarily in the submergence of the body under baptismal waters. J.B. Lightfoot wrote in his commentary, as Professor Jollett rightly observes, the apostle introduces the phrase, were buried instead of died in order to recall the image of baptism, a parallelism which disappears in our present practice of baptism by aspersion or sprinkling. And so all of these writers, by the way, uh, come from churches that do not practice baptism by immersion. And uh, in this case, uh, J.B. Lightfoot, who is a world-renowned renowned scholar, says, okay, I have to admit that originally it, it had to do with burial. It was, had to do with bury, being buried in water. And it is lost in the current way that we in our church, he was talking about himself, might have said, uh, when we sprinkle, we lose that imagery of being buried. Martin Luther, of course, who was one of the great reformers, he also commented on this. He said the term baptism is a Greek word. It may be rendered into Latin by mercio, when we read immerse anything in water, that it may be entirely covered with water. And though the custom uh, be quite abolished among the generality, and of course he's writing in the 14th century, uh, he says, for neither do they entirely dip children, but only sprinkle them with a little water. Nevertheless, they ought to be wholly immersed and immediately to be drawn out again for the entomology of the word seems to require it. It's interesting to me that Martin Luther, who is a, a great reformer, that a lot of the groups that have followed him, the Lutherans being the most obvious, they don't practice what he just preached, you know. Uh, he's, we ought to be immersed, ought to be submerged, and yet they also sprinkle. Well, people do crazy things. And what we want to encourage our membership to do, and, and you who are listening to this lesson, is to go back to what the original word actually meant, the original commandment, and do what that says, and not uh, what might be the general practice today. There are also, uh, talking about the how, there are also contexts uh, and language where you find the word baptized that, that support the idea of immersion rather than sprinkling or, or pouring. Uh, Mark chapter 1 verses 9 and 10 says, In those days Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Immediately coming out of the water, he saw the heavens opening. Immediately coming up out of the water, you know. He wasn't sprinkled. He, he went down into the water. He was immersed. Uh, John chapter 3, verse 23. John, talking about John the Baptist, also was baptizing in Ainan near Salem because there was much water there. Now, if he was sprinkling, all he'd need is a bucket for, uh, for 10,000 people. Just a few sprinkles here, a few there, a few there. Presto, you're done. But uh, he needed much water because he was baptizing by immersion. Uh, Acts chapter 8, verses 38 and 39, it says uh, about Philip when he meets the eunuch, uh, and they both went down into the water, Philip as well as the eunuch, and he baptized him. When they came up out of the water, it says then, it goes on. So once again, the imagery seems to support the idea of going down into the water, immersion, uh, not... Uh, 
a pouring or sprinkling, which would certainly not require going down into the water. Uh, Romans chapter 6 and verse 4, we've already talked about, but uh, it says, Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death. And so there it talks about baptism as a burial. And that's, you know, that's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, bury means to be put down into the ground. Uh, burial and baptism is be submerged, go down in and under the water. And then Colossians chapter 2 and verse 12 it says, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised up with him. So you have both uh, this, this idea of being buried and then the idea of being raised up. So all of these verses kind of support uh, this thought of baptism uh, being immersion. Well, I, in this segment, I want to talk to you about uh, not uh, how any longer, but uh, who is a candidate for being baptized. Uh, we really look, need to look back to the scriptures themselves. Who was baptized in the New Testament? And if you look at the New Testament passages where it records different baptisms, it, uh, you get sort of from each one just a little bit of a glimpse, but they all work together very well. Uh, the people that were baptized heard the preaching of the gospel on Mark chapter 16, verse 15. They believed the gospel, Mark chapter 16, verse 16. Uh, they repented, Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. Uh, they were adult men and women, Acts 22 and verse 12. Uh, they had faith in the working of God, Colossians chapter 2 and verse 12. Uh, they obeyed from the heart, Romans 6 verses 16 through 18. And in every case, they understood what they were doing. They knew they were ending their old lives and that they were getting ready to live a new life uh, dedicated to Jesus, right there in Romans. That's all talked about. Well, obviously then a person who's a candidate to be baptized is someone similar to these, an adult, believing adult, a person of faith, a person who knows what they're getting into, who's capable of making a responsible decision about the rest of their lives. And uh, in, in no case are people coerced into being baptized. In no case do people go through baptism merely as a formality, but it's always uh, something they do willingly and they do from their heart. It's motivated by faith. Baptism by itself is just a physical act. It's the fact that you are doing it in obedience to Christ, out of faith in Him and His Word, that suddenly something that looks just purely physical becomes instead something tremendously spiritual. And uh, we'll talk more about uh, the purpose of baptism uh, next week. But I tell you, uh, if you want the purpose of baptism fulfilled in your lives, and let me just give you a preview, if you want your sins washed away, if you want to be made right with God, if you want to be born again, uh, then uh, uh, you uh, need to uh, go ahead and be baptized and make a uh, conscious decision of faith. Well, what about infants? Uh, people uh, still wonder, you know, uh, uh, is it all right to baptize an infant? Does an infant need to be baptized? And Why don't you? Uh, baptize infants in your church and so on. Uh, they have a lot of questions about that because they love their child. They want to make sure that that child is going to be okay. Uh, but number one, one reason that the child uh, should not be baptized is that he's not able to do the things that qualify a person for baptism. Those things that we already mentioned in the list earlier. Uh, uh, he can't hear the preaching. He can't believe the gospel. He can't repent. Uh, he can't have faith in the working of God. He can't obey from the heart. And uh, he certainly cannot make a lifelong decision to end his old life, which, what kind of old life does he have? Uh, end the old life and dedicate all of his future life as a new creature in service to Jesus. But in addition to that, uh, children uh, um, are not born depraved and corrupted. A lot of people have that image. Uh, they 
are instead born innocent. They're born free of sin. Uh, that shouldn't be a difficult thing to believe and understand. Just hold a baby sometime and you tell me if they are uh, deceitful, corruptible, and horrible, or are they indeed innocent? Jesus, when he, he had children that wanted to, to be close to him, uh, those children are being turned away by his disciples. And Jesus said in Matthew 19 and verse 14, let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. So far from seeing children as corrupt and, and uh, sinful and uh, depraved, Jesus saw them as uh, little beings with pure little hearts. And uh, that's the standing of children, infants, especially before the Almighty God. A lot of people uh, have other questions, and I want to run through some questions uh, that might come from people who believe in infant baptism. Uh, they probably will ask the question again, uh, are all infants born in sin? And that's what many people have been taught, that the child is born a sinner and something needs to be done to keep that child safe. And so in many churches, some churches, uh, a little infant is baptized. Actually, uh, it is a, a, a christening, really, or uh, water is sprinkled on the baby. And uh, that uh, is what they call baptism. And it, it is supposedly something that, uh, when done, will protect that child from going to hell. But uh, Jesus said, don't, <laughs> don't prevent the little children from coming to me. I, when, when a little child dies, that child goes to Jesus. That's the way Jesus wants it, all these pure little innocent children. Uh, and they're safe. Uh, it's us adults that are in trouble. So, uh, you know, when you come into this world, uh, uh, you're not born in sin. You are born into a world of sin. And um, I heard the saying once, uh, just because you're born in a barn doesn't mean you're a cow. Just because you're born in a world of sin doesn't mean you are a sinner. You become a sinner when you yourself sin. And so uh, in Psalm 51, verse 5, uh, David says about his own birth and his birth circumstances. He says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Uh, what it's talking about is not that David was born a sinner. It's talking about the circumstances of his birth. It was, a, it was a birth that came from out of adultery. It was a birth into a sin-filled world. Uh, but uh, it is not saying that he, he as a baby was a sinner already and therefore so are all the other little babies born in the world, born sinners. Secondly, they might ask, uh, does every person bear the guilt of Adam's sin? And so this is deeply theological as well and uh, outside the scope of this particular class, the short answer is no. Uh, everyone is not born uh, bearing the guilt of Adam's sin. Uh, in the book of Genesis, when you read about uh, the sin of Adam, of Adam and Eve, uh, you read about the consequences of that sin. And so it talks about physical death in chapter 3, verse 3 and 19. It talks about pain and childbirth, chapter 3 and verse 16. It talks about the curse over the earth in chapters 3 and verse 7. And uh, these are all the consequences of that sin. We do, in fact, suffer the consequences of the sin of Adam and Eve. Uh, and though, but though we suffer the consequences of Adam's sin, we do not bear the guilt. Third, some will ask, do children bear the sins of their parents and therefore need to be baptized? Again, short answer, no. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 20, Ezekiel says, the soul who sins will die. What, what, what soul? Every soul because we all inherit it? No. The soul that sins will die. 
The Son shall not suffer for the iniquity of the Father, nor the Father suffer for the iniquity of the Son. The righteousness of the righteous will be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. And so whether you're judged uh, guilty, whether you're judged uh, uh, full of sin or evil or uh, wicked, depends on how you've acted, what you've done, not uh, who you're related to. Uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10, the Bible teaches us, for we must all enter or appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what he is what is due for what he has done in the body whether good or evil and so the consequences that we have eternally are not determined by someone else they're determined by what we have done ourselves in our own lifetimes a fourth question did the household conversions recorded in the book of acts include infants and there are several places in uh, the book of Acts, Acts 10, Acts 16, Acts 18, talk about uh, some households that are being baptized, groups that are being baptized. And so Lydia with her household and this person with their household were baptized. And some would uh, like to say that, well, that means that uh, the, ch the babies too, you know. Well, I, I think it's not true. I think first of all, even today you could say, not all households have infants anyway. In fact, most don't. Uh, life is a long life, and if you're in the middle of childhood and you have little babies at home, it might seem like it goes on forever. But for most of your life, you'll live in a household where there will be no infant. And uh, so uh, you shouldn't assume when you, it says that the whole household was baptized, that that means uh, some little babies, little children are baptized. What scripture does say in these passages about the people that are baptized uh, indicates that they must be older because there's certain qualities that they have that could only be true of uh, someone older. Uh, it says in Acts chapter 10 and verse 2 that they feared God. Those are listened. Uh, in Acts 16, 34 and Acts 18 verse 8, it says that they believed. Uh, in the case of Lydia in uh, Acts chapter 16, verse 14 and 15, there's nothing that seems to indicate that she had a husband, let alone children. So in all of these cases of household baptisms, you should not make an assumption that is unwarranted. Uh, no children are mentioned, no babies, no infants are mentioned as being baptized. And in fact, if you go throughout the entire Bible, you'll not find one occasion where an infant is baptized, a child, little child is baptized for the remission of sins. A fifth question, are children guilty because of the sins of their parents? Uh, and the answer again is no. Uh, much like uh, the case of Adam and Eve, there are consequences to sin that descendants can suffer. And so uh, a child that, uh, is born of a mother who was a drug addict, might be born with physical or mental problems as a result of that addiction, uh, the chemicals in the mother's body. But no one would say that child was guilty of drug abuse. Uh, merely suffers the consequence of the sin of the mother. Uh, children all, always suffer from the sins of their parents. Uh, that's one of the reasons we need to strive uh, to live godly lives and uh, lives that can be emulated and uh, set up as an example for our children uh, because it does, what we do in our own lives, it does affect our children uh, deeply. Uh, the Bible even says uh, that the consequences can go uh, to the third and fourth generation, Exodus chapter 20 and verse 5. In Deuteronomy chapter 9, a scripture says, Know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. So, yes, sin has its consequences, but 
Scripture leaves us in this particular passage in Deuteronomy with the, rem the memory that, that God is a, a forgiving God and that uh, there can be consequences for sin, yes, and there will be. But uh, God has his intention uh, to love us to a, a thousand generations, to be with us forever, to care about us forever. So in this lesson today about baptism, we've talked about the how, and the how being uh, we are baptized by being immersed in water, and uh, that pouring or sprinkling are not uh, descriptions of a biblical baptism. If that's the baptism that you received, you did not receive a biblical baptism. Uh, that the word itself means to immerse. The etymology of the word is to immerse. Whatever people might say, whatever a dictionary in English might say, the meaning of the Bible word to be baptized is to be immersed. Secondly, uh, about who, uh, it might be that baptism is for you. We'll talk about specifically that next week. And in fact, if you are a parent, I'm going to give you some uh, suggestions for how to prepare for your children's baptisms, how to uh, measure whether they are ready or not to be baptized. And I think it'd be very helpful. But before a person can be baptized, that person needs to be a person of faith. Uh, they are people that have to come to believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God as a result of having heard uh, the gospel. And, and then uh, they repent uh, uh, and, and confess Jesus as Lord and are immersed uh, into Jesus Christ. Uh, all of this comes together, not something a child can do, but something an adult can do. Even adults, if they haven't got faith, should not be baptized. Baptized is for a person of faith and belief in Jesus, who in the act of baptism surrenders themselves ready to die, that they might live for Jesus forever. I hope you come back next week. we got some real practical suggestions uh, for how to uh, determine uh, when to be baptized. And then also, I think some real crucial questions about the purpose of baptism. And I think it can determine whether your baptism was valid or not. Hope to see you back next week. May God bless you. Bye.